Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. And I also would like to thank uh, Nestlé for their kind invitation and Professor Cruz. Um, for me, it's a big honor and a big pleasure to be part of this symposium. So, sarcopy, um, oropharyngeal dysphagia is one of the most challenging geriatric syndromes. As you can see, the prevalence is quite high, and it will affect most of our patients at some point of their lives. And on the other hand, we have to be aware that when a patient has uh, oropharyngeal dysphagia, it has an increased risk of adverse outcomes. When a patient has dysphagia, it has between two and three times higher risk of suffering malnutrition, of suffering pneumonia or death. So it's a really important topic. But despite that, according literature, it remains underdiagnosed. We always or we usually think of swallowing disorders with some of the major complications have already appeared when someone has an aspiration or evident signs of dysphagia. So we can do better. And the first challenge would be to assessing swallowing disorders as part of the comprehensive geriatric assessment. And that's what we usually do as part of the um, acute inpatient geriatric medicine protocol. So we designed this study, and we found out that 82% of the patients had this dysphagia. Of them, one of the main risk factors for having this dysphagia was malnutrition, as you can see in the table. And even when we have a nice team and some protocols, etc., we found out that we didn't report the dysphagia diagnosis in half of our patients. So, of course, we can do better. But the focus of this presentation is sarcopenic dysphagia that is defined as the swallowing disorder that is due to the sarcopenia of the swallowing muscles and of the sarcopenia of the general body uh, skeletal muscles. This is a new research area that has been developed mostly by Japanese teams, but we consider after reviewing the evidence that it might be relevant for the care of our geriatric patients. So, if we follow this concept, sarcopenia might be one of the causes of the dysphagia besides neurological disorders and some other causes, of course. If we want to diagnose this sarcopenic dysphagia, we might use this criteria and this algorithm because it has been validated and also it's the algorithm most widely used in the literature. So according this, we have to follow three steps. The first step, we have to check that a patient has sarcopenia. If a patient doesn't have it, then we cannot diagnose sarcopenic dysphagia. The second step is that we have to prove that a patient has a swallowing disorder that is not better explained by another illness. And the third step that they suggest is using the tongue pressure as an indirect uh, measurement of the swallowing muscle strength. Following and using this criteria, there are several studies that have been addressed the prevalence of this problem across different settings. And you can see that it's also quite frequent. It might affect one out of three patients undergoing swallowing rehabilitation and almost half of the patients that are living in a nursing facility. But it's relevant, it's not just because it's frequent, but it seems that it also has a role in prognosis. For example, we know that patients with lower strength of the tongue uh, has poorer recovery of their swallowing function when they are undergoing a swallowing rehabilitation program. So it seems that it might be something important for geriatricians. But all the previous studies have been done using clinical assessment of the swallowing, 
But if we, know, if we study about swallowing disorders, we know that instrumental assessment is it's what is considered the gold standard. So I found this retrospective study where they use flexible endoscopic evaluation to assess the etiology of the swallowing disorder. And according to this study, just 5% of the patients admit in of the sample had sarcopenic dysphagia. So the author the authors just reflect on that and think that perhaps the sarcopenia might be uh, or might appear as a result of the malnutrition or all the other uh, illnesses. Of course, this is an area that needs further research to fully understand what, does, what this means for us. And after diagnosing, we have to think of designing a treatment plan. So there are two general um, recommendations that I would like to highlight. The first is that dysphagia is teamwork, of course. But the fact is that teams are different. And for example, in my team, even when we, talk, we work with dysphagia, we don't have a dietitian, unfortunately, and we don't have speech therapist. So the challenge that we face in this case is that we have to organize our teams, we have to train our teams to try to provide the best of the care with the resources that we have to the patients with swallowing disorders. And I think this is one challenge we have to face. The other important thing that I would like to point out and highlight is that according to every guidelines, we have to speak with the patients and we, the, we have to set the aims and the goals of our treatments together with them. We have to include and consider their preferences. And this is something really important for geriatricians. But when we review the research, the specific research that we can find about sarcopenic dysphagia, they, most of the studies um, are focused in rehabilitation and nutrition. So now we will speak about nutrition. And one of the main articles that review this topic suggests and recommends that we should prescribe at least 35 kilocalories per kilo per day, considering the ideal body weight. And this recommendation is based in different small studies that have proved that an energy intake higher than 30 kilocalories per kilo per day and and protein intakes higher than 1.2 grams per kilo per day might have an impact increasing the uh, tongue strength and also improving the swallowing function. But of course, uh, for, we need more studies and high quality studies addressing this topic. About protein intake recommendations, it's not just about dysphagia, of course, we have to consider the whole clinical picture of our patients, and even when they recommend 1.2 grams per kilo per day, the needs of our patients might be higher if they are malnourished or depending on their clinical situation, of course. But in patients with dysphagia, this is really difficult. Reaching the requirements with diet many times is really challenging because as we have seen in the, in the guidelines, many times they need texture modified diet. And this is a recommendation, a type B recommendation in most of the guidelines because this is useful increasing the safety of the swallowing. But on the other hand, we have to be aware that when we prescribe a modified um, uh, uh, texture modified diet, then the patients where to, who we prescribe are in a high risk and increased risk of malnutrition. And this has been widely studied, and it has been it's consistent in literature. When we analyze the intake of patients with dysphagia, the intake is usually much lower than what they need. And you can see that in different settings, for example, in rehabilitation settings or in nursing homes, as you can see in the slide. So the challenge in this case should be that every time you prescribe this modified diet, we should monitor 
the weight really closely because there, it has been described that many times the patients start losing some weight. So this is a risk factor for nutrition. So the next challenge should be trying to achieve the needs of our patients with diet. And this would be the perfect situation. Of course, we need to talk with the patients and families about uh, um, modification, uh, fortified uh, diet, and how to cook this properly. But this is not difficult to reach. And many times, the only diet is diet, pre-bread diet. So, of course, this would be what we should do. And just in the cases where, despite our efforts, um, we, the patient cannot eat what they should eat, then we can use the oral nutritional supplements, of course, as an useful tool for nutritional support. And in this case, we should follow the European uh, guidelines for uh, clinical nutrition in geriatrics because they are patients with high risk of malnutrition. And we should follow the general recommendations about um, um, assessing regularly, addressing the compliance. But in this case, we also, according to the guidelines of the swallowing disorders and dysphagia, it is recommended that we should use modified um, texture oral nutritional supplements. And in this case, it seems that it might be safer for the patient and also that we can uh, provide high quality source of protein that might have an impact in sarcopenia or, or in the muscle. But this recommendation is just based in, um, in um, expert opinion. And of course it's important, but that's what it is. I have selected this article, this intervention, because I find that this is really interesting. And we, this intervention is called minimal massive intervention. And this includes a nutritional intervention with oral nutritional in the context of a bigger intervention that includes fluid thickening and texture modified foods and education. But I don't want to forget to highlight uh, that oral health and hygiene recommendations should be always part of every intervention about dysphagia because this strategy can reduce the risk of new aspiration pneumonia and this is quite simple and really important to intervene. So this intervention was done in a geriatric department and as you can see, patients uh, that uh, under this intervention had a better survival at this chart. But every time we talk about nutrition, of course, we should think of exercise. And this is exactly the same in, in the topic of sarcopenic dysphagia. And the resistance training of the swallowing muscles, it's something that it's always included as part of the dysphagia rehabilitation programs. And this has been tested also in this setting and in this clinical um, um, problem and it seems that it's effective and that this kind of resistance training can be useful increasing, increasing the strength of the tongue and it might be useful improving the functional, uh, the functional evolution of the swallowing but there, there is conflicting evidence about that there is still many a, a lot of evidence needed yet but what I find really important interesting is that some studies suggest that the whole body intervention, whole body exercises intervention might be useful in increasing the recovery of the swallowing disorder. And also we can find some single study that proves that physical therapy without any swallowing exercise intervention might be useful in patients with sarcopenia, in this case without dysphagia, increasing the, the strength of the tongue. So this is an area of research that it's really interest, interesting that we should follow. And just this is uh, my last slide. I would like to share with you the way we organize our care in patients with acute inpatient geriatric medicine. 
Um, of course, every patient at admission, um, uh, we make a comprehensive geriatric assessment that includes a nutritional screening uh, with MNA usually, and we diagnose malnutrition with the clean criteria if needed. This comprehensive geriatric assessment also includes the review of a pharmacist that adapts the medicines to reduce the risk of, of aspiration. All our nurses are trained, or most of them are trained in swallowing assessment, and the nurse, the specialist nurse in geriatrics is the one that uh, provides education and it's trained uh, for, to talk about the patients and the families about diet modification, about other compensatory strategies like posture or feeding technique in the, in, in the cases that they are needed. Of course, they talk about oral hygiene. And this is something that we do at admissions in, in, during the first 48 hours, and many times at discharge, because the requirements and the, and the measures can change at discharge. And we try to follow most of the patients one month after discharge. We assess, even when we make a big effort and, and some educational programs, we assess the compliance of these measures. And we, as a whole, we, we just have seen that in our patients, the compliance was not that good. It was less than 40%. So another challenge is how can we uh, improve the way we communicate and explain uh, what do they have to do to the patients uh, with dysphagia and their families. And these are my take-home messages. The dysphagia, the pharyngeal dysphagia is really prevalent and we should include the, the swallowing assessment as part of our comprehensive geriatric assessment. I also would like to highlight that sarcopenic dysphagia is a new research area but might be relevant for geriatric patients. And of course, we have to use a multidisciplinary and multimodal intervention for the treatment of any patient with swallowing disorders. And thank you very much.